the QIC 890 or 891 courses for, um, for people doing that with the Institute of Quantum Computing. Um, for everyone else, well, um, welcome and enjoy the talks and you're hardly encouraged to actually implement all of this stuff anyway, because that's the best way to understand it. Um, yeah, so this week I'm going to be sort of picking up, I guess, where I left off. In the first talk I mentioned, I introduced uh, the idea of what a tensor network algorithm was and I introduced graphical notation and looked at one particular example, which was the matrix product state, and showed how that can be written in the, um, in the graphical notation. And I talked briefly about, I talked briefly about one of the algorithms, the TEBD algorithm, which is used for computing the ground state of a spin chain represented using the matrix product state hands apps. What I'm going to do this week as I'm going to talk about the, um, the TEBD algorithm in a lot more detail, uh, so that after I've talked about this, hopefully you'll all be in a position to go away and implement it. And for those of you who are taking this as part of the QIC course, uh, that's exactly what the assignment is going to be, so um, pay lots of attention and uh, hopefully it should be fairly easy after this. So, I'm going to specifically, I'm going to talk about how you will implement uh, imaginary time evolution using the TEBD algorithm to compute the ground state of a, or to compute an approximation to the ground state of a model such as the, well, specifically the criticalizing model is what we're going to look at. Criticalizing model with a transverse, well, quantum criticalizing model, so with a transverse field. I'll just write up the Hamiltonian. So we're looking at, we'll be looking at an n site, uh, as an n site chain with open boundary conditions. And so the Hamiltonian can be written as a sum over two site operators where So we have a two we have a two site uh, we have a two site operator H i i plus one, which I've written like this, and we have the Hamiltonian as a whole, capital H equals a sum over um, this two site operator acting on each pair of sites. So that's one and two, two and three, three and four, four and five, five and six, six and seven, all the way down, all the way up to sites n minus one and n. And then we also have, so what what the operator consists of is it consists of Two, there's basically two different types of term in this Hamiltonian. Uh, we have a term composed of two Pauli x sigma x operators, and what that does is it favors uh, spins on adjacent sites being aligned in the x direction. Sorry, yeah, in the x direction, it favors them being aligned in the x basis. So either both spin up or both spin down in the x basis. And then we have a term um, which is a Pauli z operator. So this is the, the and the critical sorry, this is in, this is the Ising model with a transverse field generally here. And then if we set h equal to one, then we've got the critical Ising model with a transverse field. And so we have these two competing terms. There's a term that tries to set all the spins to, to match to equal alignment in the x direction. And there's one which tries to align them in a specific direction in the z, uh, in the z axis. So 
This is the quantum critical. This is the quantumizing model, with with a transverse field, which is this field generated corresponding to the sigma z operator. When h equals one, this model is critical, and then that's the uh, quantum criticalizing model with a transverse field. Now, um, just to give you a vague idea of what's going on in this model, it's kind of helpful to look at um, what happens as we change the value of h. So, if we have h equals h equals zero, and if I if we look at um, the if we look at the uh, expectation value in the x axis in the x direction, what we have is that at h equals zero, all the spins will tend to align with each other. So they'll either all be spin up or they'll all be spin down. So you end up with um, an expectation value of x equals sigma x equals plus or minus 1. Uh, at sufficiently large z magnetization, the spins, uh, so sufficiently large value of h, you're going to magnetize all the spins into a particular direction in the z axis. So if you measure in the x axis, you're going to get spin up, spin down randomly. And so for large h, you find that um, you find that you have no magnetization whatsoever. And there is, in fact, a phase transition which occurs at which occurs, and there is a phase transition which occurs at h equals 1, where you move between these two different regimes. Now, uh, that's the point at which we're going to actually be running this simulation. And... So, the ground state is degenerate, right? Uh, yes, in... in that's right. The ground state is degenerate. Uh, in practice, when you simulate this using a numerical algorithm, the, ground state, the degeneracy tends to get broken and you end up in one ground state in one ground state or the other, rather than the superposition of the two. Um, this is, this is, so that's a sort of a quick look at the model that we're going to be simulating. But I'm going to, uh, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to get straight on into the nitty-gritty details of how we're going to compute the ground state of this Hamiltonian. So, the Hamiltonian is an operator on N sites which we can represent in our graphical notation as something like this, with n legs pointing down and n legs pointing up. The state we're going to try and compute will be represented by the, um, by the coefficient c i1 dot 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 i n, the, the tensor, the n-legged tensor c i1 to i n. Um, as I mentioned last uh, last time, and we're going to break this tensor up into a matrix product state. Uh, so we're going to write that tensor in the form of an NPS, which, as I explained, looks look, as I explained last time, looks something like this, where we have a string of tensors here with legs corresponding to the sites I1, I2, I3, and so on, up to IN. And we're going to call those gamma. And then we have these other tensors in between, so like gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, gamma 4. Then we have these tensors in between, which contain numbers obtained from Schmidt decompositions, or singular value decompositions, which I called lambda. So now I'm actually going to put another lambda on each end here for reasons that will become apparent later. Now, these lambdas on the end are very simple indeed. We have here a two-dimensional, we have, this leg has dimension two, it can be spin up, spin down. Uh, so, um, now this is a, and in the original NPS, you'd recognize that this would also have dimension two. This index here and this index here actually have dimension one. So this lambda is just the number one. Um, there's a very convenient computational reason for doing this, which I'm going to explain shortly. Uh, it just makes your programming that bit simpler. Um, in terms of actually being a representation of the state, we can ignore the fact that these, these legs and indeed those lambda, this lambda here are there at all. Because when we contract everything down, there's no difference between a tensor C I1 to I n, with its multiple legs here, and an extra leg of dimension 1 and at each end. That, that extra leg, what's the difference between a 1 by 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 matrix and a, it's like, uh, we have like a 2 by 2 
divide by so on to two matrix n of these, well, sorry, tensor, and uh, one by two by whatever. It makes absolutely no difference to the object you're dealing with. It's just a matter of convenience. So this is the ANZATS we're going to use to describe um, This is the ANZATS that we're going to use to describe our, well, that we're going to attempt to obtain the description of the ground, we're going to attempt to obtain the description of the ground state using this ANZATS. And so, we have a Hamiltonian, we have a state, we have an ANZATS for that state. The next thing we need to do is we need to make our Hamiltonian's eigenvalues strictly negative. The reason for this is because we're going to be using imaginary time evolution. The way that works is you start with a state, a random state, which is presumed to have non-trivial overlap with the, uh, with the ground state of the system. And then you apply an evolution gate, um, which is e to the h delta t. And you... Uh, you apply this gate, you renormalize your state, you repeatedly apply the gate and renormalize your state, and after you've applied this gate, um, uh, after you've applied this gate an arbitrarily large number of times, you'll find that your state will converge towards the ground state. And the, or at least it will if you've chosen your Hamiltonian so that all the eigenvalues are strictly negative. The way you can understand this is that your state originally consists of a superposition of a number of um, so your initial state consists of a superposition of um, different eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Each time you apply this gate, which is basically 1 plus h delta t, then each eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian is going to pick up a, um, uh, hang on, is it h to the h delta t or h to the minus h delta t? Minus. minus, yes, it is. Each time you apply, each time you apply this gate, you're basically taking this initial state and you're um, reweighting each of the energy. You're decomp is that you're, taking, you're treating it as if it's decomposed into the energy eigenvalues. What you're doing is you're um, adjusting the weight on each energy eigenvalue. And eventually there's, and the one, and what you're going to do is you're going to, each time you adjust the, uh, adjust the weight on these eigenvalues, you're going to favor the state with the largest energy eigenvalue, largest negative with the, with the low, with the, by choosing H to be strictly negative, to have strictly negative eigenvalues, by repeatedly applying this gate, you're going to select out the energy eigenstate that has the largest magnitude eigenvalue, the smallest energy overall. Uh, until the, and by repeated application of this gate, you're going to end up with, eventually, all the other states are going to decay away to approximately zero, and you're going to be left with just that ground state. And so that's the idea behind, um, behind imaginary time evolution. So we want to make our Hamiltonian uh, have strictly negative eigenvalues. What we're going to do is we're just going to take the two-site operator, little h, which is this here. And we're going to apply a shift to little h. We're going to um, so we're going to write that as a as a four by four matrix. We're going to compute its eigenvalues, and then we're going to subtract off the identity matrix multiplied by um, the largest positive eigenvalue, leaving with eigenvalues that are zero or negative. And so that's going to give you a, a modified form of little h here, which is going to be the, uh, so yes, um, once you've done that shift, we're going to, 
Um, you've got a little h that whose eigenvalues are strictly negative, and um, I guess one thing I should point out about this technique is that people usually ignore the fact that we've got this extra sigma z on the end of the chain. Little h puts a sigma x, sigma x on sites 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, all the way up to n minus 1 and n. Um, but the way I've written it here, it's only going to put a sigma z on sites 1 to n minus 1. When working with open boundary conditions, it's pretty common to just first of all to first of all to symmetrize. So, so this is also a sigma r, sigma z on sites i and i plus one over two. Uh, now, when you sum this up over the whole chain from sites um, one to uh, one to n minus one, you're going to end up with a sigma z on sites two to n minus one and half a sigma z on sites 1 and n. And then, in fact, is what happens is that people are typically interested in the large n limit. And so you can, um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to say, for, this, for the purpose of the assignment, don't worry about the extra sigma z over 2 that's missing on the ends. Just assume that our Hamiltonian is this, is h summed from site 1 to site n minus 1, where h is this operator here. So that's, I guess I should just make this simple. So yeah. So that's a, there's a plus in there. That's an important thing. Anyway, so now we have a Hamiltonian, big H, which we're going to write as a sum over, ham, over two site operators, little h. Each of these little h's, its eigenvalues are strictly negative, uh, zero or negative. Um, and so big H, the Hamiltonian, now has, a, has energy eigenvalues which are zero or negative. Um, also, keep track of the, ship, of, the, of the shift, the amount that you've shifted, the energy... Uh, the, 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 the two-site energy by, because what we're going, to, we're going to end up, at the end we're going to compute the energy per site, and you need to basically, if you've shifted approximately n terms each by a certain amount, then you, you're, going to, you're going to want to shift the energy back again at, at, at the end. When you calculate the energy of the Hamiltonian shifted by a certain amount, then you compute the ground state energy with that shift in place, then you're going to want to undo that shift at the end and work out what the actual ground state energy is. So, Hamiltonian. Shifted so its eigenvalues are zero or negative. Um, made up of two site terms, which also satisfy that property. Now, we, what we actually want to do is we want to construct this gate operator, e to the minus h delta t, which is our evolution in imaginary time. And we could do that the hard way. We could take our operator capital H, the Hamiltonian. We could perform a Suzuki Trotter decomposition, uh, which, if you recall, is a decomposition of any operator into into a number of layers of two-site operators, with the decomposition becoming exact in the limit that the number of layers uh, goes to in, goes to infinite. In practice. We can get away with a nice convenient shortcut here, which is just to introduce a to, which is to introduce a two-site evolution gate um, e to the minus little h delta t, which is what we'll actually be using in our um, in our algorithm, and we find that if we if we apply uh, this operator, which I'll call little u, as unit. Uh, it's not unitary, so I'll, oh, it's not unitary, but I'll call it little u anyway. Um, if we apply this operator repeatedly in this pattern, then we're going to find that that does what we want to and converges our state towards uh, towards the ground state. Uh, it gives me a word, uh, you say that when you decompose. Uh, Uh, in the limit that the number of layers in your decomposition goes to infinite, the, decomp uh, the, de uh, the Suzuki Trotter decomposition is exact. 
In practice, you may want to start, if you're working with an arbitrary Hamiltonian, your performance decomposition, um, then you might want to start with a two-layer version, a three-layer version of the decomposition, then try a five, then try a seven, something like that. See, see how your accuracy is affected by that. Because you're going to have, in the end, we're going to have a number of uh, factors affecting our accuracy. Uh, one in principle would be the Suzuki Trotter decomposition. We're slightly bypassing that by taking this gate here, uh, which is um, by just by just taking. We have a we have a Hamiltonian made up out of two site operators. In this situation, we can just take the two sort of a two site evolution gate and just use that. And in the limit that the number of times that we apply this gate goes to infinity. Uh, assuming that, that and, and delta t also goes, goes to infinitesimally small, then we actually obtain the correct, then we obtain the ground state. So what we do is we take the Hamiltonian, we, well, we take the two-site Hamiltonian, we shift it so its eigenvalues are zero or negative, uh, we exponentiate to get a two-site um, e evolution, uh, imaginary time evolution operator, and um, now we're going to start uh, applying, well, now we're going to construct an initial ansatz, and we're going to start applying this imaginary time evolution operator. And our initial ansatz, for our initial state, it really doesn't matter too much what we take. As we repeatedly apply the, um, as we repeatedly apply the imaginary time evolution operator, we're going to take that initial random set of numbers, and first of all, they're going to end up being, they're going to be turned into a normalized, uh, into tensors which make up a, a, a normalized state, and then that's going to be gradually converged to the ground state of our Hamiltonian. So, well, fire away, Sarah. Yep. Yeah. Um, Uh, well, certainly, if you were to take a uh, Hamiltonian that was constructed from something right. of this form with the appropriate... Uh, there are weights that also come in if you're doing the Suzuki Trotter decomposition formally. Uh, but yes, there are ones for which it's exact, but any Hamiltonian can always be represented exact, exactly in the limit that you go to an infinite number of layers. There are ones that are exact for less layers. I don't know what the criteria are for determining how many layers you require to get an exact decomposition. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, but yeah. In the, in the one where they don't commute, I mean, that's the entire reason why we do this, right? It's the non-commuting property, and that's right. That that's right. Infinite expansion, essentially, and ignoring the bit that we approximate. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, but that's why it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, so sorry. Yeah, in the in, in practice, we need a um, uh, kind of cut off. Chi, chi cut off, that comes into our ansatz oh, here. Okay. So for the Hamiltonian, we're just working with something that's, well, and for our evolution operator, its dimension is 2 by 2 by 2 by 2. Now, for quick note for those thinking of using MATLAB for this, um, MATLAB's very nice because you can actually store a 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 object naturally, is, like tensors are the natural objects in MATLAB. So you can have, you can construct your Hamiltonian as a 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 um, tensor. And then, but then to do this stage here, you have to reshape it into a 4 by 4 matrix. So if this, so if this is index 1, 2, 3, and 4, you're going to be fine, because reshape, the reshape command in MATLAB is going to combine indices 1 and 2 together, and indices 3 and 4 together, if you do like reshape a 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 object into a 4 by 4 object. If you chose instead to number them like 1, 2, 3, 4, MATLAB will naturally try and combine these two indices and these two indices if you use the reshape command. And then you, you get a mess. Because what you're looking at here, when you turn it into a matrix, you want to look at it as a matrix mapping between a state on these two sites and a state on these two sites. So that becomes, say, that index and that becomes that index. Um, so yes, practical point number one. Uh, don't get to, uh, be careful. Be careful which index corresponds to which in MATLAB, 
and be aware how the reshape command is going to combine and separate indices. Same thing again when you reshape this back, this one is going to become indexes one, indices 1 and 2, and this one's going to become indices one, 3 and 4. Um, now, so, yes, next thing we want to do is we want to actually start applying our imaginary time evolution operator. And so we take our ansatz, and we're going to start at one end. So we're going to start on sites 1 and 2, and we're going to apply one of our evolution operator gates to these two sites. And so the way we do that is we take the lambda at the left, the, so I guess we'll call these lambda 1, gamma 1, lambda 2, gamma 2, and lambda 3. And it's quite convenient to store all of your lambdas and your gammas in a cell array in MATLAB. I'm sure there's equivalent structures in other, uh, in say, Mat uh, Mathematica probably, I don't know. But they know you're planning on using Mathematica to do this. But yes, um, so you have a collection of gammas, you have a collection of lambdas, you need some way to keep them organized. In MATLAB, cell array is nice. Uh, what you're going to do is you are going to take this part of the ANSATS and you're going to apply your gate here. And what we want to do is you want to go from this basically back to something that looked like the original ANSATS with these five terms in it there. Uh, just thinking here. I might be able to. Yep, yep. Um, now then. Yes. Just thinking about this here in this particular approach. Yeah, it's, it's still best to always keep these guys on here, and I'll, I'll explain that in, in due course. So what we actually do here is we take this object, and what we're going to do is what we what we need to do is we need to contract all of this into a single tensor with four indices, corresponding to this index, this index, this index, this index. So first thing you need to do is you need to program a piece of code that's going to contract two tensors together. Uh, so all the easy, exam easy examples like what I told you earlier, for example, matrix multiplication, you might have two objects, A and B. Um, A has two indices, 1, 2. B has two indices, 1, 2, or whatever. What you need to be have is a piece of code that you can tell contract in tensor A with tensor B. Um, oh, it's probably a good idea to have to tell it A has two indices, B has two indices, and I want to contract index 2 of A with index 1 of B. More generally, you might have something like um, A has five indices, B has five indices. I want to contract indices 2 and 3 of A with indices 4 and 1, respectively, of B. Um, And so this would be like if we had an object A and B, and now A has one, two, three, four, five indices, which I've chosen to number like that. And we're contracting index two of A with four, index three with one. I have no idea why I'm doing this. I'm just, this is just a random example I've created. And we'll just pop those out like that. Um, now, a very important thing to notice to note is, so, what I've said here is, hey, let's just, let's contract indices 2 and 3 with 4 and 1. Great, all very well and good. And we're going to obtain some object C. When you're writing your code to do this, or, uh, well, actually, in the interest of making this not, in this assignment not ridiculously large and complex, I'm going to provide some code to do this in MATLAB. Um, it's going to, I'm, I'm going to make it fairly well documented so you can see what it's doing, so if anyone working in another language should be able to transfer it across fairly easily, or at least to pick out the key concepts as I, in, the, in the way that I've implemented this. But um, what you have, the way I'm doing it, we're then going to, you're left with several indices left over. 
and the way I, and you need to know what order these indices are going to be on C. One convention, for example, would be to have the indices on A in numerical come out in numerical order. So we have index A1, then index A5, corresponding to indices 1 and 2 of C. And then we'd have um, index B2, oops, uh, B3, and B5. Uh, coming out, and so as indices 3, 4, and 5 of C. But the point I'm making is that basically, keep track of your indices. Don't, uh, MATLAB is not psychic. It can't tell that if you, want, if you wanted the indices to come out, say, in order A1, B2, B3, A5, B5, it's not going to know that. You've got to make sure, you've got to think about these things. You've got to think, okay, I'm, I'm going to contract these indices with these indices. First of all, make sure that you're, you're matching them up correctly, 2 with 4, 3 with 1, for example, and uh, not the other way around. Um, keep track of which index is which on your tensor. It's all too easy just to draw the diagrams and forget whether this is index 1, this is index 2 on the object that you're storing, which is sort, sort of some object A, which is 5 by 5 or whatever. You forget which of your five-dimensional indices is, is, this, is this one out here, which one is this one out here. Or you forget to actually take care when you're implementing it in your code and you get your indices switched around. Very easy to happen. The main things to keep track of when you're implementing stuff like this is which index am I actually connecting with which here? Have I done it right? And on the thing that comes out, which index was which on the original objects? Um, in MATLAB, you can always use permute to rearrange them. So if C comes out like this, A1, A5, B2, B3, B5, and you want these two the other way around, then you can use permute to swap around indices 3 and 4 on C. Um, also, just because I've chosen to draw my tensors with the indices in order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, doesn't mean that you have to. I've seen people draw tensors where they're like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, whatever suits you, but keep track of where your indices are, and keep track of which index uh, on your diagram corresponds to which index in your code. So it's like, if the one in the middle on your diagram is the fifth index in your code, that's fine, so long as you remember that. So, so what we're going to do now, what you're going to do now is you're going to want to take these one, two, three, four, five, six tensors and contract them all into a single tensor. Um, conceptually, not too, not too challenging. If you can contract two tensors together, you can contract six. You just do them two at a time. Contract, say, these two into a single tensor, then these two into a single tensor. Sounds easy. Next thing to watch out for is not all sequences of contraction are equal. If you have, let me give you a very simple example. Uh, first of all, let's let's say, what's the computational cost of doing a matrix multiplication if this is, say, a 2 by 3 by 5? Uh, say this is a 2 by 3 matrix, and this is a 3 by 5 matrix. So we're multiplying something that's got uh, two rows and three columns by something with three rows and five columns. And so we're going to get something which is 2 by 2 by 5 as our, as our output. To actually do this, you have to perform how many operations? Well, roughly, it suffices, as a sort of a crude measure, it suffices just to count the number of multiplications you have to do. So we have to get this, this value here, we have to do 1, 2, 3. Get this one here, we have to do another 1, 2, 3 multiplications. Turns out that to perform a multiplication of two, uh, two matrices together, you have to do... Um, you, have, you basically take the three indices and the connected indices and you multiply them all together. So in this case, you have to do 30 multiplications to perform this matrix multiplication. More generally, if you have a bunch of tensors, if you have one with, say, if you're doing, say, something like, like this, then... Then again, what you do is you just have to, you just have to multiply together all of these 
all of these uh, dimensions of these indices. Quite easy to see why. If we've got two indices here, A1 and A2, suppose those were two spin sites, for example, each of dimension 2. Well, we can collectively enumerate those with an index of dimension 4. So like for, that's like, for example, going from uh, a basis on each site to a basis on the two sites together. So, we can t so basically what you can do is you can take these two indices and combine them into a single index, these two indices and combine them into a single index, these two indices and combine them into a single index, and then you're back to here. And when you combine two indices together, you go from, say, 2 and 2 to 4. Say, for sake of argument, 3 and 5, that's a dimension 3 index, that's a dimension 5 index. Well, you can represent, um, you can replace that by a single dimension 15 index. Um, just think of it as, in each instance, you could, say, look at this object in isolation, this one here. It's got, say, 2, 2, 3, 5. Uh, the dimensions of its indices, you can say, well, what if these were actual physical sites? We've got a site of dimension 3, a site of dimension 5. Together, we've got something that's, uh, we've got a spa Hilbert space of dimension 15. So we just represent this by a single index ranging from 1 to 15. Same over here, and so what you basically end up with is for any tensors you're contracting, you take the product of all the three legs on uh, tensor A, multiply by the product of all the three legs on tensor B, tensor B and multiply by the product of the dimensions of all the legs that you're contracting on, just the ones. Um, so that's how you work out the cost of contracting two tensors together. Now, the problem. If I give you a diagram like this, and I tell you that these indices are of dimension, say, 2, 2, and 10, and we'll call these A, B, and C. Now, suppose the first thing we do is we contract together um, indices, uh, tensors A and B. This first operation costs us 10 times 2 times 2, because we're, we're looking at just this part of the diagram here, free leg, free leg, shared leg. So total cost of uh, 40. And then we're going to contract AB with C. Uh, and that's another cost of 20. And, well, a tensor with no legs is a number. We've actually, uh, but, but I mean, just in this particular example. But yes, we've got a total of, cost of, total cost of 60 to evaluate this diagram here. But if we went in a different direction, if we first contracted B and C together, then sure, the first step costs us 40 again. But the next step only costs us four, because um, we've basically we've we've got rid of that dimension ten index, and we've got and our second step is much is a much smaller multiplication than our first step than our second step in the other way I showed you. So the order in which you contract your tensors together is important. If you uh, it's quite easy to pick really it's it's quite easy to pick really daft orders. It's fairly easy to find a reasonably good order. Uh, to be certain you've got the absolute best order of contracting all your tensors together, basically takes a bit of time with a pencil and paper and just really um, just plowing through the, um, through the non-idiotic poss uh, possibilities. You can automate it, but it's not worth your bother in this little, little assignment. Um, what, you, what I'd suggest you do here is simply assume that in all situations, just assume that these bonds here, which um, the bonds along the backbone of the MPS, assume that they're much larger in dimension than these bonds here, the physical indices. So if we call these dimension little d, which in this instance equals 2, these are also of dimension little d, and we're going to assume that all of these are of dimension big d, which is going to be... Uh, the maximum dimension that you allow your MPS to, uh, your, you allow the uh, indices in your MPS to go to. That's that approximation parameter that we talked about in the last session. Um, if you make that assumption, then you're going to get, and you, and you work out the cheapest sequence for contracting this diagram, 
then you're going to get a sequence that's going to stand you in good stead in the middle of the chain where the, um, where the contractions of these diagrams are the most expensive anyway. When you get out towards the edge of the chain, where these are sort of 8, 4, 2, 1, then those are fairly cheap operations anyway. You're not dealing with great big tensors. In the middle of the chain, it might be 100, 200. So towards the edge of the chain, you really don't care if your sequence is not optimal. So save yourself a bit of effort. Just work out one sequence, uh, which is best for the middle of the chain, and use that everywhere. Um, yeah, so. So you've got your code for contracting two tensors together. Uh, you've applied it sequentially to contract these six tensors together. And you've got your, um, you've got your collective blob tensor here. And now what you're going to do next is you're going to break this back up into uh, gammas and lambdas. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to divide it down the middle here, uh, which you do by um, combining this index with this index, and this one with this one, so you have a matrix. Then you singular value decompose that matrix. So I'll sort of draw that like that. Then you singular value decompose that matrix. Let's draw a single in it. And then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to truncate S, perhaps. Because in general, if you're working if you're saying the maximum dimension I'm going to allow here is big D, it's possible that these bonds here may now be larger than big D. In fact, they could be anything up to two, say, this is going to be, this is going to have physical dimension little d or two. Up here, we have dimension big D. So what we see is that when we do our singular value decomposition, these could have a dimension up to two big D. We've got to truncate this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our, our singular values, our Schmidt, uh, Schmidt coefficients, and we're going to retain only the D largest coefficients. And so we do that, and we similarly we truncate u and v dagger, so that um, u is now 2d by d. Um, s is truncated to be d by d, and v dagger is truncated to be d by 2d. Next thing we have to do is we have to keep our state normalized. So what we require is that um, trace, of, trace of S squared equals 1. Uh, so that's just a simple rescaling of the coefficients that you've retained. If you do this, your state will stay normalized. Um, some of this is going to seem like magic right now. It might become clearer as I explain it. It might become clearer as you actually implement it. There's a, there's a good reason that this is how you normalize. For now, I'll just tell you this is how you normalize. Then you take u and v dagger, and you go from u like that to being, to being a, well, it's still not a gamma yet, to being u like that. And the same with v dagger. And then the final thing we need to do is we need to, uh, we absorbed lambda 1 and lambda 3 into these. So what we need to do is we need to multiply by the inverses, which is easy to do because these are uh, diagonal, um, these are diagonal matrices. So we multiply by those inverses and we have a new gamma 1 and gamma 3. And then we're going to, so we've done that on sites 1 and 2. Now, the next place you want to do it is on sites 3 and 4, then on sites 5 and, five and 6, because we're working along the, uh, the top row of this Suzuki Trotter decomposition structure. Uh, all very well, we could just jump ahead to sites three and four. We're not going to. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to sites two and three. 
And the reason for this is as follows. You recall that last time I told you that one way to create an MPS is to start with a state and perform repeated singular value decompositions so that you end up with like sort of a U, an S, then you have a V dagger, which you're going to re-decompose. Um, and of course, your U is unitary, which means that U, U dagger is just the identity. Um, now we're going to, and then you decompose that V dagger, and you get something that's sort of, we'll call it U prime, S, uh, V dagger prime. You re-decompose that, you get U double prime, S, uh, and so on, all the way down, until at the end you have a single V dagger. Uh, now you see what's going on here? We've got lots of U's and only one V. Now the U's, a U at the end here satisfies this relation, relationship that we've got U, U dagger equals the identity. Also when we have U, S, when we, have, when we go from the U prime here, I mean basically it's like performing a Schmidt decomposition between this half and, well, these coefficients correspond to performing a Schmidt decomposition between this half and this half. And, and we, um, because we've got U and U prime here, because of the way we've constructed this, we're going to find that u, u dagger, s, oops, sorry, that should be s prime, s double prime, um, s prime dagger, but then it's diagonal and, diagonal and positive, so s, sorry, so s dagger, s dagger actually equals s. Uh, then we have u prime, u prime dagger. We find that this also equals the identity and so on, all the way along, looking left. Looking right, we have that V dagger V equals the identity, but we don't have that, for example, U double prime, U double prime dagger, um, S double prime, S double prime dagger, V dagger, V. That does not equal the identity. Reason being that the, uh, we constructed these U double primes in our final Schmidt decomposition at the right-hand side here. And these U's are, designed, are constructed so that they'll form the identity to that side. And the V's constructed so that they'll form the identity to that side. Um, but... This, but there's absolutely no guarantee, and in general, this will not hold in this direction. So we've got a structure, the way I've created it here, starting at one end and running along. We're fine looking to the, looking to the left, we can easily pull, out, pull identities out of nowhere. Looking to the right, we can't. Now, we're actually going to care about this shortly, because this is very useful when we, when we want to calculate the actual energy of the state as we go along. What we want to do is we want to... I could have equally have started at the other end and got it so that it was lots of identities. We could easily make identities to the right, but not to the left, out of uh, V, V daggers. And this would have been V dagger prime, V dagger double prime. Now, when we do our singular value decomposition in this step here, we're introducing a gamma which is obtained from a U and a gamma which is obtained from a V dagger. If we're careful about how we go about this, then we can, we can make life very easy for ourselves by having a long string of, by always, wherever we're, wherever we're just working at, we can have a long string of U's to the left and V's to the right. And the trick for that is, as we go along, on sites one and two, we're going to, we're going to apply a Hamiltonian on sites one and two, so we have a gamma derived from a U, we have a lambda derived from an S, we have, a, um, we have a gamma derived from a V dagger. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our lambda, sorry, that's lambda 1, lambda 2. This one here is, is lambda 3. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our, and that's gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to sites 2 and 3. And 
we're going to turn site two into something that's also derived from a U rather than from a V dagger. One way of thinking about it is all we're going to do is we're going to apply the identity gate here and do exactly the same as we just did with the evolution gate on sites one and two. If we do that, we, ab we absorb the identity gate, then we decompose. We're going to get a, another object that's derived from a U here. And this one's going to be derived from a V dagger. And so as we go to the right, we leave a trail of objects that are derived from the, like, the left side of the singular value decomposition, what I'm calling U. Um, and then we're going to work all the way over to the right. Sites three and four, we're going to use the, ev we're going to use the evolution operator. Sites four and five, we're going to use the identity. Five and six, the evolution. Six and seven, the identity. Um, so that we leave a trail of U's behind us. Then when we get to the right-hand end, we're going to turn around and we're going to work back. So for this, this row of the Suzuki Trotter decomposition, we work that way. I should use a different color. For this row of the Suzuki Trotter decomposition, we work that way. For this row, we're going to work that way. Then we're going to work that way again, then that way. Um, so yes, we go all the way to the far end, then we turn around and we come back. And previously, and where we used H, so where we use where we used the evolution gates, um, we're going to use identities, and where we used identities, we're going to use evolution gates. So it's like doing the second row, heading back in the opposite direction, leaving a trail of V's behind us. So once you've done one pass in each direction, as you carry on repeating this process, wherever you are. Wherever you're just working, you're going to have U-derived objects to the left and V-derived objects to the right. And this is nice. The reason this is nice is because it lets you calculate the energy really easily. But that's the next, that's the next thing. So you now, know how, you now know what you're going to do to evolve your state. You're just going to repeatedly apply this sort of evolution gates and identity gates from one end to the other, and back again, and across, and back again, and eventually you're going to converge to the ground state. Or at least you are if delta t is, uh, you would do if delta t was sufficiently small. Um, in practice, how small is sufficiently small? You just try it and find out. You start with some moderately small delta t. You might say choose delta t equals 0.01 or something, see how you go with that. And then you'll run a number of iterations of your algorithm, you'll watch what happens to the energy, which I'll tell you how to compute in a moment. What you should be seeing is that the energy goes strictly downwards until the algorithm converges to the best accuracy it can with that time step, at which point you'll sort of see your energy sort of start to jiggle around. This is assuming your algorithm's working correctly. Uh, other sources of jiggling including botched co include botched code, so be sure to make sure that you're seeing some actual steady decrease uh, at the beginning. If you don't see that, try a smaller value of delta t. If you still don't see it, uh, you probably need to go and debug. But assuming that you do see an initial sort of decrease in energy, um, energy and iteration or yeah, time or number of iterations, and then it sort of plateaus out, then you might decrease delta t by, say, a factor of 10, and you'll find your energy decreases further, then plateaus again. Repeat until energy uh, is no longer changing at the level of accuracy you desire. You can even automate this procedure when you're really confident in your code. You can tell it, OK, if, say, uh, 10 out of the last 30 steps, the energy's gone up, then we're definitely in a wiggly regime. So decrement delta t. Uh, up to you how much you want to automate it. At first, you'll probably want to stay very hands-on uh, because if the risk of automating something like this is that Something strange happens in your code, and before you know it, these systems have started responding to bugs, and, is, and they've dropped delta t by a factor of 10 billion, and nothing is happening anymore. And you'd really like to see what was actually happening and try and figure out what was going wrong. So automate with caution, but once you're confident in your code, it's a nice thing you can automatically have the size of delta t step down as you, um, as you run your... As you run your um, as, you, as you run your software. So the final thing is how to compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, the energy. Okay, um, I'll just wrap up quickly. 
So the final thing you need to do is compute the expectation value of the energy. Now, because the Hamiltonian is a sum, we can write the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is the sum over of some of the expectation values of its terms. Um, each individual term, well, when you're working on, say, sites two and three, and you, uh, we, can, we calculate each term as we work, so we work out the expectation value of H23 when we're working at sites two and three. So say you've just applied an evolution gate to sites two and three. Um, now you're going to compute the expectation value of H23. And the way you do that Gamma 2, gamma 3, lambda 3, uh, lambda 4, lambda 2 here. Now, lambda 2 dagger, gamma 2 dagger, lambda 3 dagger, gamma 3 dagger, and lambda 4 dagger. Um, Now, to calculate, so this is like, the, this top bit here is, is, we're looking at a little bit of our MPS, so that's like the state. Here we have H23, the operator. Here we're looking at the conjugate obtained by vertically reflecting and complex conjugating all the coefficients in our tensors, so that's the bra. Um, now what about all the rest of these states off here? Remember how I said that we choose it? The way we do this is so that we have all U like stuff off to the left and all V like stuff off to the right. Very convenient. It means the entire left of our diagram collapses into a, um, a delta function, an identity. Basically, we just link up these two indices here. Same to the right. And so that's your diagram for computing the expectation value of H23. Now, in the limit that your algorithm converges, H23, for example, is not going to change from pass to pass to any significant extent. Well, in the limit it's converged, it's not going to change at all. So you just compute each one as you get to it. Uh, and you don't worry that your ANSATS is actually changing as you go, because uh, this expectation value ultimately will, will converge. And then you'll end up with H23, the expectation values of H23, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6. They'll all be stable. And so you can work out the total, you can, work, you can sum them all up and get the ground state energy of the system. And so, that's how you do the TEBD algorithm. And I'm sure there's bound to be questions, uh, but it looks like we've run out of time in this room. So I'll call, that, I'll call that a day, and if there's any specific questions about any parts of this, then people can grab me afterwards and we'll take it to maybe the Feynman Lounge or something. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.